if you like betting on golf. But everyone that you back misses the cut, get some experts involved. With all the stats and the tips and so much more, cause it's the golf betting system, the golf betting system is the golf betting system. Greetings and welcome to the Golf Betting System podcast. This is our 2024 Masters Tournament in-depth research podcast. Barry O'Hanrahan and Paul Williams join me, Steve Bamford, to discuss this year's much-anticipated first major championship. Hi guys, how are you both? Afternoon, Steve, Barry. Yeah, all good here, thanks. Afternoon, guys. Please subscribe to this podcast as you drive the popularity of the show. This podcast is for listeners of 18 and above. Please be gamble aware. You can visit begambleaware.org for more information. And of course, please bet responsibly. Visit our world famous golf betting system website where we have our Masters research preview. We've got major championship form statistics that Paul has pulled together lovingly. Masters strokes gained rankings. I think that's the first time we've had strokes gained rankings for the Masters. Mm, yeah, three oh, years yeah. worth now. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. And Masters course form stats. Can you believe it? All of this valuable information and statistical analysis is available completely free of charge. There is no paywall. We're available on X. You can follow us. Uh, Barry's at a good talk golf. Paul is at golf betting. I am at Bamford Golf. Subscribe to the Steve Bamford Golf YouTube channel where this podcast is available along with my weekly golf betting show. If you are listening to this on the pod, uh, on the YouTube channel, don't hesitate to press that like button and subscribe to the channel as well. Right, now you guys, as listeners, power this podcast, so we need your five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts as ever. For those of you who leave a review, I will read them out at the start of a future show. Leave your name and where you are in the review. Now, this individual has completely ignored that. It's Jay Marino 13 We do know, though, he's in the United States of America. Hi, Joe. Uh, His title is awesome, five stars. These guys go into so much detail... Love the site and the podcast, exclamation mark. That's it. Short and sweet. Brilliant stuff. Thanks, Jay. Best of luck next week. Nice one, Jay. Thank you. Right, before we set off on this voyage of Masters Tournament Delight, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Paul Williams, who will take you through the Golf Betting System Majors competition, which in 2024 is sponsored by Bet365. Over to you, Paul. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, if you've um, if you've played before, then it's the same as previous years, effectively. If you haven't, then dead simple, and we'll put the full details and a link to the rules within the podcast description. But basically, we want four names: one name for the Masters, one name for the PGA Championship, one name for the US Open, one name for the Open Championship. So four different names, four different players, and what we'll do is we'll collate their dollar earnings from each of the respective uh, major that you select them for. We'll create a little mini leaderboard of all the entrants all around the world who uh, who play this year. And we'll, at the end of the Open Championship, declare a winner, a second and a third place. And there's cash prizes for those first, second and third place finishers. So basically, four names, four different names, and we'll see how they fare and the better they finish, the more dollars they earn, the more points you get, the more likely you are to win a prize. Top prize is £150 or currency equivalent. Second is 75 Third is £25. And big thanks again to Bet365 who have sponsored the competition every year for, I don't know, was it now, say, 10, 12 years? It's a yeah. it's a number, a, a long time they've been uh, supporting the competition. So thanks to them. Don't forget, if you're new to Bet365, then you can grab their latest Bet10, get £30 or euros in free bets promotion um, using the bonus code SPORTS30, SPORTS30, full T's and C's in the uh, podcast podcast description on the website check them out and if you haven't got an account then uh yeah well worth it with bet365 they are truly excellent for golf i must say sport 30 for your 30 pounds of free bets with bet365 if you open a new account all good 
I'm getting so excited, chaps. Mm. I can almost, uh, I can almost, it's almost see there, the, first, isn't it? the first tee off time on uh, on Thursday. On Thursday, yeah. Where should we start on this voyage of delight? Uh, let, let's start, shall we, with the basic uh, premises about the golf course, Augusta National. Designer, Dr. Alistair McKenzie and Bobby Jones, not 33 original, but they are basically renovating this course every single year. Big, big mm. renovations in 22. Uh, last year, they, they, they extended the uh, 13th, the par 5 on Amen Corner. There's fresh renovations this year as well. I'll take you into those details in a short while. Course type, my classifications, classical golf course, old style. It's long in length, undoubted. I'm categorising it as technical as well. The scoring numbers that we have seen over recent renewals, 10 under, 10 under and 12 under last year. Um, it's, it's not as easy as the course used to play. I think weather has a lot to do with that. We've seen a lot of gnarly, nasty, cold weather here recently. Mm. You haven't, I can always remember sort of Phil Mickelson walking around in his shirt sleeves, getting a bit of sweat on when he was slapping the ball around and getting 16 under around here. But you don't seem to get that much anymore. No. It's more kind of woolly jumpers and uh, bobble hats. Mm-hmm. And 35 mile an hour gusting winds. <laughs> Tends to keep the scoring down a bit. Yeah. Doesn't do a lot, does it? In terms of the agronomy, uh, oh, I didn't even say the yardage. The yardage is fresh this year, chaps. 7,555 yards. The reason for that is they have put a new tee box on Pink Dogwood, the second hole, which is a par five. Uh, it is 10 yards further back, and it is further to the left of where the original tee box was. The idea being they're trying to bring the right fairway bunker more into play. Mm. They've also, and this came out in Rory McElroy's interview yesterday at the Valero Texas Open, added new green complexes this year. They have added them on holes two, pink dogwood, four, Flowering crab apple, one of my favourites, and six juniper. The idea of the new um, green complexes is to um, be able to have flexibility in terms of pin positions. The two and four green complexes are definitely, Rory says, going to have new middle of the green pin positions. And he was talking about a new back hole position on a new ledge that they placed on the 6th green at Juniper. So 7,555 yards. It plays as a par 72. Four par fives. What else do we need to know? Clearly, no rough in play. Uh, they, don't, they, don't, they don't have rough here, do they? They have a first cut which is ryegrass. It's 1.38 inches every single year in length. The fairways are rygra- uh, The fairways are also ryegrass mixed with Bermuda grass. And the uh, greens themselves, it's the first time in 2024 that we will have seen bent grass greens. Other things to note, a plethora of uneven fairway lines, Clearly, the um, this golf course as well, with its valley setting, has got lots and lots and lots of um, what's the word I'm looking for? I've gone, I've gone blank. Ele- ele- elevation changes. That's the one. Elevation changes. In old world, in, in my in my world, that's uphill and downhill. Yep doesn't really come across like that on the tv as much but um certainly listening I to think the... when you get there you realize yeah yeah one day we'll get there steve it's like if you're if, if you if you're into your motor racing brands hatch they go hurtling down the home straight and they go into a bend called paddock hill bend and when you used to watch it on tv you're like oh it goes down a bit when mm. i've been there it's it's literally like the north face of the eiger <laughs> and you're like how the hell do these cars and motorbikes go around here at over 100 miles an hour mm. I think it's going to be something similar to that when you actually go there. It's like, oh, my Lord. 
I think good courses to link into on that basis, definitely Kapalua, the plantation course. Mm. And you do see a lot of players that win here or do well here have got excellent records at that tournament of champions because that, again, it's just elevation changes everywhere. Uh, Riviera is another one that kind of links down into that as well because Riviera, loads of uneven lies, lots of hanging lies and uh, plenty of holes with elevation changes, especially the 18th. So... Um, yeah, I don't know really. If we, I mean, most people know about all this stuff. The one, the one fact I do like to throw out there: the fairways are traditionally mown against the hole to minimise driving distance, effectively meaning this golf course is now likely to play circa seven thousand nine hundred yards in length. That's crazy. Mm. Pretty long. And. It's also, to me, it's a bit like a kind of Carolina golf course on heat because on steroid, on steroids, because a lot of these holes, it isn't just pure grunt. It isn't, it isn't bomb and gouge, this place, by any way, by any means. For, well, there isn't any rough for a start, but you can't just blast it around here. You have to position your ball all the way around this golf course because of various dog legs. Because you might find that there's a 20, you know, a 15 or 20 yard stretch of a fairway that has an even line compared to uneven lines in other places on that, on that fairway. There's all manner of, of small intricacies here that can really make a difference, a huge difference to scoring. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a gig where I think experience pays, but it's just, it's just, you've got to be on the ball all the time. You cannot afford silly mistakes around here. Mm. Although saying that, John Rahm didn't he? Didn't he double the first last year and still won? He did. Mm. So there goes that stat out the window. <laughs> it's possible, <laughs> but it was, but it, but it was something we relied on for quite a while. That like, don't make doubles or worse. So. You know, it's it's as mo- I love I love you know getting the trends um, the trends together because they can help you like narrow down the field. Mm. Um, and uh, who who does the trends piece every year? Dave Tidmore. Yeah, that's it. His name escaped me. I love that article every year. It's like it's now part of my master's like warm up and prep. I kind of read it last night, but and those trends they do help kind of narrow things down. But there's always, I always like to think, I think there's an exception to the rule. Mm. But just just to keep it in mind, like so, if somebody hasn't had a top ten before, kind of just, but they might have had a top fifteen. Kind of just just kind of keep them in that little gray zone and don't just put a line through them straight away, because that could be the one player that kind of does it. There mm. are so many trends, and there's always an exclamation. There's always a bracket at the end. But these guys are the exceptions. <laughs> mm. Eight of the last ten, nine of the last eleven, ten of the last fifteen. Mm. Yeah, here's one for you. Ten of the last twelve have had one in their last six starts. You think, oh, that's a good stat, and then you then you read, ah, oh, but Patrick Reed and Matsuama are the exceptions to that rule. Yeah, but then that's why you were getting a premium on their. Well, not that's why that was one of the reasons you would have been getting a premium on their price at the time. Yeah. Mm. Versus the short prices that have won either side of that or around that over the last few years. Barry, I know you're into your golf architecture greatly. And you are a crusader against what the PGA Tour tend to be doing (laughs) on their tour in recent times. And I know you have many supporters in that uh, that (laughs) fight, that fight that you're having with the PGA Tour. What's a 30, 30 second synopsis of Augusta National for you? Well, first of all, I don't think the PGA Tour realise they're in any sort of fight with me. <laughs> There'll be litigation heading your way. Uh, I should have said allegedly. To, allegedly fighting. Alleg- alleg- allegedly, yeah. There's, there's been no shots fired from my side. So oh, I yeah. just don't. I, they just don't need to spend as much money with the the local fire departments on the <laughs> for the water. Uh, but like, the, I, on on that point, I think there is a. They do have a lot to kind of contend with in terms of 
changeable weather in the States can happen very quickly. You can get a couple of dry, sunny or dry wind days that can completely crisp and out and kill a golf course very quickly. So, you know, they, they probably, they are on the side of caution. Um, so, and I kind of, I kind of guess I understand that. I mean, anyway, moving back to Augusta, uh, off the, we're not at the PGA tour next week. We're on a, on a major, uh, I, look, it's, um, it's almost surreal how perfect it all appears on TV. There isn't a blade of grass out of place. You don't see divots on the fairways. It's um, and it, for any of the pros, it must be a very special thing because you just don't get to play golf courses like that uh, hardly ever. So there's probably a little kind of awe factor when you're there in your first one or two years. And I'd say it never loses that magic. So mm. you're always going to feel like special playing that course. Um, as an amateur, we'd all be terrified to take divots for fear of hurting the golf course. So uh, I would anyway. Um, so yeah, it does. It, uh, I think just because of how perfect it is, you, you know that it then there's less of the golf course can be blamed for anything that goes wrong. So it all falls back in onto you. So like a psychological thing that you, you know, it's requiring exactness and perfection and that pressure builds throughout the week on every single shot you play. So, you know, you know, it's all about you and there's very little externality. You can, you know, external things you can blame it on maybe a bit of wind, but the course probably won't screw you over with, you know, a, a poor condition of something. I don't know. That's that's a very unusual answer to to your question about a, a golf course. But how, uh, that's that's how I kind of perceive it. Like it impacts you in a in a mental way, yeah. Because it's just diff- quite different from from all other challenges. Asks a lot of questions, Barry, doesn't it? That's why you're on the podcast, Barry, because your obtuse views that, <laughs> that we would never ever come up with. I know you love the course, though. I tell you, I tell you, I tell you how Rory McIlroy thinks this course plays, and how you need to tame. This is how you tame Augusta. Yeah? First thing he answered was discipline, which made me chuckle. With Rory, mm. sticking to the game plan made me chuckle. With Rory, and then this one really made me chuckle. You can't be tempted around here. He also said high lines when it comes to reading putts, which I thought was interesting. In fact, mm. overread the break is what he's saying there. Right. Putts. And then he came out with this quote, and I think this is absolutely brilliant. Good golf at Augusta feels like boring golf. And I think that is something I have always struggled with because that isn't my game. Good golf at Augusta feels like boring golf. Mm. Now, there used to be an argument that just hitting greens was the absolute key statistic for this. And yep. if you went round and just churned out greens in regulation, um, gave yourself chances, didn't make bogeys, um, then you know you, you could potentially be there a Sunday afternoon in with a shout of winning it. And I guess in a way that... That, that would be defined as boring golf. You know, Scott, Scotty Scheffler goes out and absolutely pounds the greens in regulation this week, putts averagely. Then, you know, it, that that could be the definition of a you know, a, a boring win, I guess. Quite. Is, there a, is there a psychological approach to tweaking your, like your reward system? to get excited about playing a boring approach because that is a successful shot around there. Mm. So it's not the actual shot itself. It's how you react to the shot or how you perceive Mm. what an exciting shot is. Exactly. It's almost like these people that only like to play well in birdie fest where you're shooting 28 under par. But as you always say, you're still shooting the same number of shots, really. It's just a, it's just a nominal number, isn't it? Mm. Around here, you've got to basically say, look, if actually, if I'm not going to go for the green here and be tricked into making double around on this hole, I'm just going to play for par. Overall, you're closer to the end result, aren't you? Which could be putting the green jacket mm-hmm. on on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Discipline. And it, it's a it's a it's a great thing about majors when when they are you know 
the weather and everything cooperates that you do get this very distinct and different style challenge than the one they're presented with for 90% of the weeks on tour. So it's, you know, you're having to make a change mentally and on, on how you're approaching a course when you're practicing something completely different for most of the rest of the time. So it is, it's a hard thing to switch habits and especially yeah. just to snap your fingers and do it on, on, on one given week or four times a year maybe five or six if you get one or two particularly tricky courses but yeah it's uh that's that's another um really interesting element to like preparing yourself it's not just a major it's also a different style of challenge that you that you're used to to playing mm. i'm sorry to be focusing on rory but it, it's not a deliberate thing but it's just that i watched the interview a few hours ago and the, some of the stuff he was saying was mm. so pertinent another thing he said was that if you were given the if you know if the, if if a professional golfer of his caliber or you know on the PJ tour was tasked with shooting level par seventy twos for four days around Augusta, he said that's great. You'd go into it thinking, well, this is a relatively easy task for us. And he said, what would happen is you'd be playing away and you'd probably backdoor a sixty nine or a sixty eight, and you know you'd be good about yourself. He said, when you turn that on its head though, and you're tasked with having to shoot a sixty seven around Augusta. You're, that's also bringing 76 and 77 into play. And that's how this course is. And that, I thought, was a perfect analogy. And that's going to this thing about not being tempted, forcing. We've always said here, Masters winners are always up with the pace at the very, from the very first round. You cannot come from way back to win this tournament because for every birdie you make, you're making a bogey as well. And that's Augusta National. You yeah. can't force it. Yeah. Yeah. You can get away with it for nine holes, though, when you hit a hot streak. Yeah. But I, it just doesn't feel like anybody's forcing it in those situations. It's just they found, like, this beautiful kind of Venn diagram where they're swinging well and pins match and they're seeing reads and a couple of puts roll in. And it doesn't feel like they're necessarily forcing the issue to go with certain things. It's just thing, the blocks fall into place nicely like a good Tetris puzzle for that particular stretch of holes. Yeah. That's probably why we see so few true contenders um, who are tackling it for the first time. You know, these golfers will have watched the Masters for many years before they get to play it for the first time and will probably feel like like we do, that they, we, you know, we know the holes. You know, as, as observers, as viewers, we know the holes. But actually going out there and trying to execute it and not being overly bullish on the holes that are simply par holes, holes that you just need to cross off and uh, attack the ones that are going to offer you opportunities further down the, down the line. Take some discipline. I, I think, I think that's a good, good mentality, a good, good way to think about the course actually. Like I read about Max Homer was, um, they've done a commentary. He did a commentary on uh, some of the holes on the masters app, which as always is just phenomenal. Mm. The, the st- all, if wish all apps could be even close to how good that is, but he was doing a commentary on the front nine. And I think Tom Kim's done on the back nine of making my way through it. But Max has said he's never birdied the third hole, which is a short par four. You can drive it up into the throat of the green to just have a, a chip shot up or, which seems to be the more popular approach to playing that hole these days versus laying up to the you know to a full wedge distance. He's played it ten times and he hasn't birdied it on a, on a really short hole, which you'd expect these pros to to make. Yeah, you know, yeah. maybe two birdies out of those ten occasions. Yeah, yeah. fascinating. Since uh, Dustin Johnson's blowout here in November, where he uh, scored 20 under par, the course averages have been, bearing in mind it's par 72, they've been 73.06 Matsuama, 73.95 the year Scheffler one, very windy, 72.96 last year. That, In terms of difficulty ranking, 7 out of 51, 3 out of 50, and 6 out of 40. Interesting numbers. Um, I will ask you guys. In fact, I'm going to. I am going to do that now. In your opinion, I'll start with Paul. What do you think are three absolutely critical skill sets that a Masters winner needs 
to tame Augusta National? I, I, I think you've just touched on one of them, which is discipline um, a second ago. I think um, having just discussed that, then that's got to be part of the mentality. But I think um, you need some length of the tee. Um, I think you can just about get away with this as a medium length hitter if everything else works but the shorter hitters I just don't think on a course as you've described that can stretch in reality up to you know touching 8,000 yards yeah. in terms of the way it really plays yeah you know a guy, a guy who's averaging you know in, in the lower parts of the driving distance stats it's just it's a hell of a task particularly on the scoring holes on the back nine to to not be scoring on those and to still be compiling a score, that's um, uh, that, that's just not going to happen. And the other one I think is approach game. Um, historically, greens and regulation, we've got strokes gained approach as a as a more accurate proxy for that nowadays. And I think if you were to pick out one statistic, focus on one statistic to start your analysis from a strokes gained perspective, then strokes gained approach would be the one. Make sure you're getting yourself into a position where you can either easily make par or give yourself a birdie opportunity. And, uh, you know, slowly but surely compile a score that's getting you close to that kind of 10 under number for the final nine on Sunday and then see what happens. Yeah. So we've got mid to strong power off the tee. Mm. We've got excellent approach play. Barry, but what else do you think is necessary to be a champion here over and above those two things? Just from your kind of watching or your statistical analysis that you've done on this? I don't do statistical analysis. That's for you guys. Um, look, I have nothing to back this up, but it's more just a, a feel point that I'm going to try and make. But it, it, it kind of it's complementary to the strokes gained approach or just the approach play. The ability to move the ball a little left to right and a little right to left can really help you access certain hole locations. Whereas you're playing to a safe spot, but you're allowing the ball to be moving from that spot towards the hole yeah. without, you know, so it, it allows you to minimize the risk and and maximize the the result of a safe shot. So that, that that I like to see that in a player being able to move it a little bit both ways doesn't necessarily have to happen off the tee, but with their approach shots to the greens, you can you could be playing to a very conservative target, but mm -hmm. it can end up with a very very beneficial result, or to give you even a twenty foot look for birdie versus a tw thirty or thirty five foot look. Um, that that's one to me, which is not essential, but a very nice one to have if you can if you have a player that can do that. Mm -hmm. Um, that was the one that was kind of overriding. It might be my one and only point. I mean, look, the, the length off the tee is one we all know. Very bad. You know, it's, it's, be be long enough. You don't need to be mega long, but be long enough. Um, look, short game. Yeah, uh. the ability to the ability to scramble when you've missed the green. Hopefully, yeah. not in a disastrous spot, but um, to to have something that combining you know spin control and trajectory around those greens when more often than not you're playing those shots um with the grass swept towards you so you know places more of a premium on the accuracy of the strike of your 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 chip shot or your flop shot whatever you're going for and then to combine that with um just that just that kind of harrington level of grit of just getting the ball in the hole for a par, just scrambling like it's just, you're not giving away that uh, that shot. You're, you're getting that bar. So um, I think that that for me is, uh, you know, one that you, um, it's great to watch. It's even better to see happen when it's one of your bets and you, yeah. you see him miss the green, your head goes in your hands, you're going, oh no, he's going to make double from here because he's, and then yeah. somehow pulls off a good shot and then holds an eight and a half, nine footer for par, yeah. which he's 50 50 to make, maybe, you know, and it's just, um, your fist bumping does. Yep. yep. I actually think that short game is overlooked here as a real thing that you need to win here. I'll go into that in a, in a slightly more statistical data in a, in a second, but 
I also think one of the keys here is a, is a mass is a high ball flight. So that's another statistic I look out for, and also the ability and the I wouldn't say ability, although that's part of it, but also the mental approach that you've got to be a kind of a player that's more than. Uh, especially on these par fives, you've you've got to be able to um, have that bravery to sometimes actually just say I'm going to go for it and make and make go for that green and two. Mm. That kind of works in tandem with discipline because there's going to be certain times you can't, but certain times you've got to. I mean, the putt, the fifteenth is that's that's a really easy um, example, isn't it? The amount yeah. of times that you've got people that mm. aren't in the ideal spot and they still go for it and then they end up in the water at the front, the water at the back, yeah. when actually they should have just said, no, we're going to lay up here and yeah. just go in, with that, go in with that short iron for the third. At least then you're making par at worst rather than du- making bogey. <laughs> and this, again, this is the point, isn't it? This is Augusta. It's boring golf, some of it. Mm. We've only got three sets of strokes going data for this. Bearing in mind that only, what, how many players, 50-something, make the cut? Yeah, 50 in size. Yep. So these strokes gain numbers are off of a you know, a 50 um, if in the field kind of ranking. So Rahm, Scheffler, Matsuama, just where they finish these various uh, strokes gain skill sets against their peers that particular year, average it through. Strokes gained off the tee, 11th. Strokes gained on approach, 7th. Strokes gained around the green, 4th. That's crazy. Strokes gained tee to green, 2nd. So this feels very... We were talking about the Players' Championship a few years, and that was the same kind of metric there. Strokes gained off the tee, not as important. Although it's hardly players, I think they, we were looking at an average of like thirty fifth in the field. Yeah. You've still got to be long here, but approach and around the green game is so so critical. Strokes game putting, eighteenth. If you look at the traditional statistics, the old driving distance, fairways hit, the stuff that a lot of people ignore these days, but I still have a look at them. Driving distance twenty first, accuracy twenty sixth. Wait for it, Paul. Greens in regulation, sixth. Now, I'm looking over 14 renewals here. The yeah. average greens in regulation of the winner, sixth in the field. Yeah. Scrambling, tenth. Putting average, twelfth. That's crazy. Mm. So, yeah. short game and greens in regulation. Long to mid irons and a bit of pop off the tee. If you got all of those and your game's in good shape, you might have a crack at this, I think. I know we've probably done this on many of our preview pods before. What's the? Do you have the average green and reg percentage of the winner, or an average green and reg percentage of the field each year? Uh, the percentage. Like, I haven't got the percentage on me. I, I'll have to do that for next year. I'll make a mental well mental note. I've forgotten it in five minutes, but I'll just read through yeah. the last few years. Seventy-two point two for Ram. 68.1 for Scotty, hence why you're starting to see why short game's so ex- important because you know a lot of these PGA Tour events now, it's 88% GIR, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, Hideki, 69.4, greens and reg. Dustin Johnson in that crazily soft year, 83.3. Mm. Tiger, when he won, 80.6, and he topped greens in regulation for the week. Patrick Reed has won this as low as 66, so two in three greens. Mm. They That's all. Patrick Reed. They all, bar Woods, who didn't need to because he was basically on the dance floor pretty much the whole time, had scrambling numbers of 16th for Reed, 5th for DJ, 8th for Hideki, 9th for Scheffler, 9th for Rahm. Yep. It's Immaculate around the groups. Yeah. You can't be an auto bogey, can it? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. No, you probably need to be scrambling, what, two-thirds of the time, maybe? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Major championship golf, baby. Major championship golf. It's where we're at. <laughs> Just have all parts of your game 
being pretty damn good for the If week. you've got that, if you've <laughs> you know, got it's, the it's, ability it's to, a, yes. Yeah. Simple it's as not that. a big ask. Yeah, just <laughs> just sort everything out for one week and have everything go your way, and then you you might have a chance of winning. Just from a ratio's perspective, bearing in mind we had a tournament last week where it was pretty much 52% of the strokes game were on the greens and 48 were from the tee to the green. Stefan Jaeger won. Look at this golf course. 88% tee to green, 12% putting. Mm. I genuinely think a great statistic to look at here is lag putting from 25 feet and beyond. I don't think that's a bad stat to look at if you're a statistically minded Mm. individual. Someone that can just nerdle the ball up to two and a half feet away from the hole from 45 feet across a green that's got huge ridges in it try and find a statistic for that one and running 14 on the stimp yeah (laughs) Yeah. it's easy easy tournament to win right (laughs) yeah (laughs) well where do you want to head chaps we've talking we've we've spoken about the course we've spoken about the agronomy i could mention the amounts of rainfall i mean we're recording this Yes, please. We're recording this a week before the actual tournament, and a lot of you are going to be listening to this during tournament week. So it'd be churlish of us to actually start talking about what the weather forecast is suggesting. What I can what's tell you is the amount like of rain. What's been like until now, Steve? Well, okay, we might do that. <laughs> yeah, but for the year so far, because are we are we going in with like a very yeah, yeah. high water table? Well, this is it. Yeah. If it was in the UK, the, I would have thought the place would be flooded, and that's with the sub air um, working. But uh, <laughs> it, it would be it would be underwater here in Ireland. In I will say so they much. have had plenty of rain, just like they did in Florida before all of their events. Um, four, four and three quarter inches in January. That's one hundred twenty one mil. Three point nine inches in February, just under a hundred millimeters. Last month, five and a half inches of rain, one hundred forty three mil. And already, as of yesterday, Wednesday, they had another three quarters of an inch. Sorry, that's wrong. A third of an inch. Ten mil. It looks okay between now and the tournament, though. I was having a peak beforehand. Looks like yeah. It's going, dry. Uh, it's going to be dry. It's going to be dry right through to tournament Tuesday, and then you're looking at some kind of, the forecast is suggesting up to 50% chance of rain. Thursday, though, does look wet and windy. This far off, I can see Shane limbering. Shane Lowry limbering up right now. There's some wind. Wind on Thursday and Friday. Like it looks like it could be very interesting watching mm. if it stays like it is. I did mention I used to categorise this golf course as a mid-score golf course. Sort of 15 to 18 could win it, but as we said earlier. Tens and twelves are the winning totals. This and that brings certain players into the mix. And it ejects other kind of players. But just, I mean, it's way off. This isn't going to be calm by the looks of it. This isn't going to be um, a a golf course where there's no wind and beautiful sunshine all the way. There looks like there's going to be weather involved on this long-range forecast. Whether that's for the full four days, who knows. But certain Thursday's been looking bad for a few days that I've been tracking it so I think they're going to be I think the players are going to be throwing different meteorolo- meteorological challenges put that way that's what we like to see absolutely Paul you've got a trends piece there haven't you because we're not we're, we'll talk about players that we're interested in towards the latter end of this research podcast start throwing some trends at us because you're you're the trends guy yeah, I, you know, in times gone by, um, pre-live, you could get really quite defined with this. And um, going back to Barry's point about the, the fantastic piece of work that Dave Tyndall does, that's you know, Dave tries to pull out the, um, the 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 salient points and find a find an answer to it. And um, I think the problem you've got nowadays is that a number of the statistics that we have looked at and do look at for this. Um, specifically exclude the live players because they simply yeah. won't appear on any of these numbers and i think that's dangerous because yeah if you are you know we came into this 12 months ago and you know we, we were wondering whether there would be a live player who competed and seriously contended and 
you know, it, it was it was difficult to gauge. And of course, Brooks Kepka was was there, and um, you know had had a real opportunity to win, didn't he? Um, I think it's you almost need to come back and approach this from a slightly different way now, and uh, and and see where it takes you. But yes, there, there there are some 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 trends that you can work through. I think if you get as brutal as the um, the two trends that you've touched on um, recently, Steve. So ten of the last twelve players have won in the last six starts. Um, there's another one which um, we've talked about various major championships, and that's performance in the previous major from the previous year. So eleven of the last twelve champions had a top fifteen or better performance in one of the previous year's major championships. That's right. Yeah. So, so, so those two stats. So, so, ten of the last twelve had won in the last six starts. Eleven of the last twelve had a top fifteen the previous year in one of the majors. If you get as brutal as that and say, okay, that's my shortlist. I'm just going to go with those two statistics. You're down to nine players. <laughs> and, uh, I, I'm on. Well, I, I did actually bring a post-it note. The listeners will be chuckling. I've got my post-it note here. I've got my pen. <laughs> Is this the post-it note of success, is it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It and you know me. I'm high-tech, mate. Pen and pe- pen and post-it notes. Here we go. Away you go, ta- Paul. I'll take a screenshot of my analysis, Steve, and send it through to you. Well, you can All right, the nine that. are... That's scaring in, me there. Go on. <laughs> the nine in uh, some kind of logical order are Scotty Scheffler. Won't surprise you to, to hear. Rory McIlroy, Brooks Kepka, Wyndham Clark, Hideki Matsuyama, Dustin Johnson... Bryson DeChambeau, Tommy Fleetwood, and Austin Eckroat. Eckroat? Eckroat's interesting, isn't he? He won um, PJ National, didn't he? Uh, he did. Tenth... And he, did he get somewhere half decent at the US Open? It's Yeah, 10th at the US Open. And that was just his mm. second major appearance. Um, missed the cut at the US Open a few years prior to that. So... He's coming into this. Yeah, it's his um, his first Masters start, and you know, there's all of the history, the fuzzy Zeller quotes, etc., um, around this. But he's coming in with the recent win, um, tenth off the back of his last uh, major outing. I, you know, I don't think he's going to win. I don't think he'll even place. But I think there's potentially a market for him out there. Whether that's top twenty, top debutant, something like that, that kind of thing. Um, two hundred and fifty to one outright right now, and uh, with the bookies and five hundred on the exchange, and that probably gives you a um, gives you a good indication of what the chances are of him actually winning. But that, no, listen, I'm, I'm not saying Austin Eckert goes and wins this tournament because that's that's um, a bit fanciful, I think. But I think there's scope to find a market for him somewhere because there's uh, there's enough to like, I think. Um, one that just misses out is Joaquin Neiman. Now, Joaquin's won three times since no, uh, since December, actually, and was 16th at last year's Masters. Yeah. That was, so we're argue, arguing over a place, yeah? yeah? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And that was his best major finish from what I counted up, 19 starts. But, you know, that suggests that he's um, getting his head around getting to grips with major championship golf and you know there was a time not so long ago where you know observers of golf looking at the entirety of the golfing landscape including live were you know were, were saying well look is Joaquin Neiman the most informed player in the in the world right now you know that was before Scotty found the putter and um, I don't mean there's much of a question about it right now but you don't have to go back long to to ask the question and to you know, to be making a case for Joaquin Neiman. You know, does he win? Again, it's, you know, no no major top 10 in his uh, in his CV so far, but could he place? Could he could he contend? Yeah, certainly a uh, certainly a question. You'll notice there was no John Rahm on that list and there's there's a few reasons why you might be a little bit um, down on John Rahm. Defending champions don't have a great record and on your um, preview piece, piece, Steve. You've you've articulated that, and I think you have to go back all the way to to Tiger in two thousand and two. I think it is from memory. Yeah. In, until you find a defending champion who's successfully uh, defended here at Augusta, but um, yeah, Ram since he's gone to live, the form's just not quite been there, is it? 
Uh, no Xander on that list. Uh, no Hovland on that list. He's been off the boil since uh, since Eastlake. You know, going back to Eastlake, he was again. He was absolutely on top of his game, wasn't he? Um, no Cantley, and uh, you know we could discuss Patrick Cantley for for five or ten minutes on here and still not get to a point where I'd be comfortable backing him. I don't think. Um, no Please wins. Let's not. <laughs> ten seconds is enough. <laughs> Yeah, no wins now since the uh, summer of 22. Um, I've got a couple of other bits I can run through quickly. You talked about wind and the forecast. I have just did a little sneak peek as to how the predictor model would look next week, uh, notwithstanding what happens this week, of course, in Texas, um, in terms of wind. So I'll, I'll give you the top 10, as it stands right now, of what the wind statistic on our predictor would look like for next week. Uh, Justin Thomas, Rory McIlroy tied ninth. Max Homer eighth. John Rahm seventh. Denny McCarthy, good win player, sixth. Yeah. Harris English, Emiliano Grio tied fourth. Sung J Im, another good win player, tied second with Scotty Scheffler. And the top win player right now would be Tony Finau. Tony mm. T ten at the Masters. Finau, who can uh, can certainly get the uh, get away, can certainly score when there's a little bit of wind in the forecast. But yes, those are some of the some of the angles that I've been looking at. I've got a couple more which I'll run through quickly. If you average out, and there's again there's lots of statistics that will pump into the predictor next week. But if you average um, performances, long courses, classical courses, um, bent grass greens, and wind. Then the top 10 that would come out of that right now. Max Homer, Pat, um, Hovland, Morikawa, Xander in seventh, Cantley, Tony Finnau in fifth again, JT, John Rahm, Scheffler, and number one would be Rory McElroy. Yeah. I suppose we need to put a big asterisk next to the predictor as well, because again, it's not capturing this data, data for live anymore. Well, no, so you've and... got a whole host of players that you're not capturing data for anymore. I, I hate this. I hate these times. It just, uh, it's, it's just sad, really. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting. We used to have point. all the players that could easily categorise because they all played against each other. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting point because um, one of my tasks for next week would be try to produce a predictor that actually balances this out a little bit. Um, one of the things that I've done, and, and we talked off Mike Barry about uh, a certain player, which I'll, I'll talk about in this just now. Um, but I've mm. looked across greens and regulation performance across all tours where it's captured for the last six months. So I've yeah. pumped in live performances, Asian tour performances, DP World, P, uh, PGA Tour, anywhere where one of the players that's in this week's or next week's field has played and averaged out all of their greens and regulation performances. Oh, brilliant, yeah. For six uh, for the last six months. And that does bring some of these live players to the fore. Now, again, I'll read, I'll read through the top ten. Oh, are we giving this data away for free? Are, are we crazy? <laughs> well, yeah, madness, I think. Um, Go on. Top ten of the blended greens and regulation for the last six months. I make it. Number ten, Dustin Johnson. DJ, I think DJ's got a good chance next week number long number nine ludwig oberg hmm. number eight john rahm number seven patrick reed now when really? i <laughs> when i looked at this i thought well the numbers must be wrong and went back and had a look through and if you go through patrick reed's last six months there are some really really strong greens and regulation performances his last start in macau which was a couple of weeks back he hits 87.5% of greens in regulation. Wow. Finished with 64-63 to finish fourth, I think, from memory. Patrick Reed finding greens in regulation, that is something that will find my notepad rather readily. 80-1 yeah. to one Patrick Reed. And we know how well he can play here. Mm. At number six, Bubba Watson. Um, number five, Bryson DeChambeau. Number four, Sergio Garcia. So you can see it's bringing the live guys into the into the conversation here. Number three, Scotty Scheffler won't surprise you. Number two, equally won't surprise you, Corey Connors. Number one might surprise you, 
Joaquin Neiman. Now, I wondered, I wonder, looking at these stats, whether the courses that the Live guys have been playing have generally been slightly easier in terms of grins and regulation for these guys to appear so readily on those statistics. But straight line average across everyone's performances over those six months uh, would suggest that we cannot and should not ignore some of these guys that uh, uh, you know could be featuring this week particularly those that have got a decent record here at Augusta over the uh, yeah over the last few years interesting stuff uh, that is awesome stuff Paul uh, how with all the money Liv have and they're throwing hundreds of millions around do they not have a, f- a few volunteers or a few people to track strokes gained mm. yeah it's just just us like it's so it's it's just baffling how they don't do it yeah yeah it's a, it's a real shame isn't it because we could have a true view rather than just a guess as to how some of these players are, are actually performing mm. well maybe 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 they are they have them tracked in some way and they don't want to release the data because it might not be as flattering as we might think it to be yeah absolutely it, it might reveal something about the, the quality of golf being played or the difficulty or easiness of it. Yeah. As, again, you know, looking at these numbers, does it suggest that this, the setups are slightly more straightforward? Greens are more readily, you know, easier to hit. There's certainly been, you know, Bryson shot 58, didn't he? Um, a few starts back and there's the 59s out there, lots of low scores. So, Potentially, you know, there's, potentially there's something in the argument that the, the you know, the, there's still a difference between these, uh, between the quality of the, um, the tournaments that are being played. But even so, you only have to go back to last year and talk about Brooks at the Masters, Brooks winning, you know, what, his fifth major championship later in the year. It's yeah, there's there's plenty to chew on with this. I think. I think uh, I think what we're going to see this week across Live Miami is going to be very interesting playing mm. the Blue Monster because that is yeah. that's a proper golf Durant, course yeah. as we know. And when we, mm. if you go through the winners list and the runners up list list of the WGC events they used to hold there, it's just a who's who of Augusta. It's mm. incredible. Yep. DJ Mickelson Woods Reed. There's a whole list. Even Charles Svartz will finish runner up there one year. Yep. It's madness. So be, I'm, I'm looking. I'm going to keep a very close eye on uh, Live Miami this week. Um, in terms of uh, since 1960, now, uh, Jack Nicklaus, Faldo, Tiger Woods, the only players to have defended the green jacket. Tiger defended successfully in 2002. Interestingly enough, and this is the thing I find really interesting from a betting perspective. Only Woods in 06 and Jordan Spieth in 2017 have finished in the top five when defending. So even if you're backing these players each way, you're getting your bum kicked uh, mm. on a regular basis when you're back in the green jacket. So Rahm's nowhere near my list at all. That's uh, that's one thing that's that, that I'm definitely going to stick with this week. Should we get into some players, do you think? Do it. Do it. Now, we have coincided this podcast record with the fact that Boyle Sports are the first bookmaker for 2024 Masters to actually open up their default betting market. They've gone from anti-post to default, which is very courageous of them, on a Thursday. So a full week before the tournament actually tees off. So well done to Boyle Sports. For that, we're going to use Boyle Sports prices for this podcast on that basis. They're a little scared with their prices. Yeah, <laughs> but then that you're comparing I'm, I'm, them. I'm going to say it. You're that you're comparing. You're not really comparing like for like, are you? True. Sure, but yeah, they're. Little, I'm still going to say it. They're a little scared. Yeah, I have no affiliation. They don't pay me. I'm going to be honest. I can see what you're saying. It's um, it'd be a conversation more to have with a, a with a real view on Tuesday, I suppose, on the basis of everyone will have yeah. their real markets out. Mm. But yes, 
I'll use their prices though during this, just as just as where we're at. Okay. Um, I was going to say that they are eight places each way at fifty odds. Uh, as of Masters Tournament Monday, they will have the pick your place markets available, where you'll be able to choose ten or even twelve places for the twenty twenty four Masters. How many competitors are we looking at this year, Paul? Uh, 89 I think right now so we could have another if um, we have a non-exempt of the Valero, winner of yeah. the Valero I think that so will you be can it. you can be covering 10 or 12 places off of a 90 man field maximum mm. next week with Boyle Sports they're playing a 50 odds on those ex- extended places even better for those of you who don't have access to a Boyle Sports account register via a golf bank system and place a first bet of 10 pound and you will receive a boosted £20 in free bets plus a £10 casino bonus welcome offer for those of you 18 plus in the UK. I am going to lovingly place a link to that offer with T's and C's in the podcast description. Right, here we go. Chef Lafour to one. McElroy 10 to one. Defending champion John Rahm at 12 to 1. So those are the top guys. Then we've got Brooks, Kepka, and Xander at 18 to 1. I, I can't help but titter when I just read Xander's name. He he causes such differences in opinions on X. It's it's funny, it really is. You get the truthers, you get those that just constantly hurt on the guy. He's your typical Major championship, 18 to 1 price is Xander. Then Matsuama and Jordan Spieth at 20s. We've got Barry's love child, Joaquin Neiman at 22 to 1. (laughs) Followed by Ludwig Oberg, Patrick Cantlay, who I went back with yours, Wyndham Clark, Bryson DeChambeau, Victor Hovland, Cam Smith, the list goes on, Justin Thomas, Will Zalatoris at twenty five to one. Dustin Johnson at twenty eight to one. Now I'm just going to bring this to the party. Trends and all that. Brackets. There are ex- <laughs> there are exceptions. But if you look at this factually, four of the last five winners of the Masters. Have been nine to one, sixteen to one, nine to one, and sixteen to one. Mm. The one that wasn't Boo. was Matsuama, who hadn't even got a top ten in the season prior to winning this. Shoots down so many of these statistical trends. He was forty-five to one. So I'm. I, this is how I'm trying to frame this in my mind before I write my final preview on Monday morning. So four of the last five have been 16 to 1 or below. From that point on, it's 28 to 1, 28 to 1, 45s, 45, 55s, 55, 66s, and 90 to 1, Charles Svartzel. So straight away, I'm saying to myself, there's a bit of a death trap here. Anything beneath or between 16s and 28 haven't won the Masters since 2011. Mm. Now, that rules out, I mean, we're only using ball sports odds, but that rules out a whole list of 25 to 1 shots that I've just almost lost breath with reading out. If you're going to be kind of blunt and blase about it, well, I'll tell you another one I was going to shout out there as well. Um, only the first, the, the last debutant to win here, the old fu- the old fuzzy Zeller number, uh, it was fuzzy. The wa- last player to win their first ever top level tour title, being the Masters, Butch Harmon in 1950. Wow. So if Cameron Young was to win this, and it was his first ever main to a title, he's broken a trend that's 64 years and counting. 
He was in the top ten here last year. Was Cam Young? Yeah, yeah. He's got, he's got a um, he's got a major game about him. Oh yeah, and as regulars know, he, another player I finished second place on a couple of mm. weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't. He could have. Yeah. Does he have that? He kind of gives off a bit of Xander vibes in terms of his ability to grab and win a tournament. Has all the things you kind of want in a player to to you know to be betting on, but mm. for want of a better word, that X factor. All is of missing. those, all of those odds I mentioned were for the winner. Okay, and at the end of the day, we're, we're looking for the winner here, aren't we? We're looking for the winner. If you're looking from an each way perspective, though, Phil Mickelson last year was two hundred to one full each way return. Russell Henley, 150 to 1. Patrick Reed, 66 to 1. Year prior to that, we had Corey Connors at 50 to 1. Sung Jay Im at 50 to 1. All full each way returns. Shane Lowry at 45 to 1. And the year before that, Will Zalatoris on his course debut, 80 to 1. Finished runner up. Also in the places. Connors at eighty to one, Rose at ninety to one, Leishman one hundred and twenty-five to one. So you're I'm, not this... mention, I'm not going to mention Dylan Pratelli Paul at two hundred and fifty to one in November twenty twenty, and CT so, Pan five hundred to one. You, there are big me... price. There are big price places likely to be there. So you, you're telling me there is a chance for Austin Acro then? Definitely. Hmm. I won't be backing him, but there's a chance. That's probably to, that, that's probably to your benefit, Paul. That Steve yeah, is staying away. Is, is, I've, I've, I've just put an extra tick by his name now. Well, I'm going to open the floor to you guys. I don't know. I mean, I've been backing Scotty Scheffler recently, four to one. I did. I did say last week. The only reason I actually put him up at Houston was he was three to one to win that, and he was four to one best price, seven to two to win the Masters, which I thought was ludicrous. Yeah, yeah, and he came mighty, mighty close to winning, didn't he? He came was it one five and a half foot putt from forcing a playoff, so it was yeah. close. It's a good bet. Just didn't work. Four to one. He, <sighs> does he win this? Does he win this one in four? I I just wonder what what number he'd have to get to 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 make it. I I, I might just be patient on it. I I, I can't see Scotty Scheffler not being in the mix. No. Um. Gone back. I, th- sorry, I think he, I just to answer your question, Steve. Before Paul moves on, I think he wins one and four, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to bet him. <laughs> so, I, it, yeah. Oh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a logical better or one that kind of. Um, track stuff properly I'm just going to do it for fun probably lose money at it but it's, it's just entertainment I just I think he wins one and four but I've just that just doesn't uh, float my boat no I, for me if the number were to get north of five I might be quite tempted and I wonder when everything settles down and we're looking at the market on Wednesday afternoon um, particularly in, on the exchange, if a lot of the mainstream tipsters have deliberately avoided Scotty Scheffler, whether we'll see numbers that mm. are starting to get more attractive. But yeah, if you're betting him, right, he's, you're going to be betting for win only. Oh yeah, oh yeah, surely. Okay, so what? Like, wait for here's one like, like way I would think about it. Wait for the tea times. Hope he's off in the afternoon wave and see does you know do a few players get off to a few decent players like big names get off to a, a good enough start to be a, separate themselves from mm. him by a few shots and hope his price drifts out a little bit yeah mm. like if he's starting four or five behind the lead is five under yeah yeah lo and behold might even can't... make a might even make a bogey in, on the first few holes and all of a sudden there might, you yeah, go. I see what you're saying Mike gets uh, and I, but that's a risk because it might not work out. No, it might not. And but we do, when he we goes do birdie, often... birdie, one and two. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, we we do see. And, oh, just like the speed years where he just ended the tournament within two two or three holes of starting. You're like, yeah. oh god, it's over. Job done. We do often see some of the really big names in some of the 
very late marquee groups on Thursday. Um, but mm, equally, yeah. we often see a lot of the first round leaders come from back end of the day as well. Um, so, yeah, I, the, 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 the draw will be interesting. Um, it may shape where or how I choose to play Sc- Scotty because I haven't quite decided yet. Um, but it could be a draw, a draw bias yeah, based it on could the be. wind as well. Absolutely, it could be. And, you know, to go back to the point about the about the wind, there's potential for that to be impacting Thursday and Friday. And um, if it looks like there's a bias one way or the other, then that, you know, could well influence how that, uh, how that all shapes mm. up. What about you, Steve? Are you, you tempted on Sky? Oh, well, I, I've been mulling over the uh, the process of putting him up at win only six points or whatever the, the the thing is, and and then just covering off players that are deeper in those odds in that in that juicy twenty eight to one and above level. Mm. But I don't know. I'm kind of moving away from that in my thought process over the last few hours. Would you back any of Scheffler, McElroy, or Ram? The only one I would back would be Scheffler. And this is the kind of stuff the listeners okay. want to listen to, I suppose. For me, I've got no interest in McElroy. I've got no interest in Ram. That's a flat red line through, not one iota of interest. So if you go back to your point about the four of the last five winners at 16-1 to 1 or shorter, then... If your assertion's right there, then Scotty wins. Mm. Potentially, although you've got to ask yourself, these are the odds on Thursday. What mm. happens if... We, I was having this chat with Andy Lack, uh, Andy Lack on his podcast yesterday. There's going to be a couple of players that might get sucked into this 16-1 to 1 level. One is Brooks Kepka, who's won five majors. One is Xander, just sheer weight of money. And one would mm. be Jordan Spieth if he goes absolutely ape at the Valero Texas Open. Mm. Yep, yeah, can see that. The it's, one it's, player I have got significant interest in, as ever at a major, will be Brooks. Because I know how Brooks works. And I think what happened to him last year is something that's going to deeply motivate him to put right. And uh, when you've won six majors, just have a look on Wikipedia and start seeing what kind of names you're surrounded by. Yep. Phenomenal. Mm. Don't forget as well, he wins this. He's won away from the Grand Slam, which would be the Open. So I I think Brooks, you've got to have a serious look about Brooks. Yep. And there's good money coming in for him today, just while we're here on the podcast. He's... He's been backed in a number of places. Yeah. He's only won five majors. You, you have to be thinking I was living in an alternate timeline there where Brooks had won six, Steve. <laughs> I think he was talk, talking about winning his sixth. Winning his sixth. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, winning, winning his, his sixth. sixth. Okay. Bad headphones. Um, I mean, to me, uh, it's not a question. It, uh, if I'm looking at the three guys at 20 to 1, who would you back? Where? How would you number them, Steve? Kepka number one, Xander number two, and Jordan Spieth would be number three. Mm. For me, I just haven't seen anything out of Jordan that gives me any confidence that he would actually win a major, even though it's his favourite golf course in the whole world. Anybody, any idea how just moving, seeing, just looking slightly below that, the next kind of tranche, Clark, Aubert, Thomas. How is Justin Thomas 25 to 1? Best price, 28. No idea. His, did, he just never, his price never moves. Did we get any information on why he split up with Bones? No. I I didn't yet, anyway. I suppose that's something that wouldn't it, be put public, wouldn't it? Oh, it'll leak out at some stage. There's always just this fear from the bookies, isn't there, that he'll find that magical week which we know he's capable of doing there's just no indication that it's any time soon but 28 to 1 and uh, he probably won't probably won't shift massively from that point during the course of next week he'll have his backers at that at that rate mm. 
In that 25s, ball sports, 28s that are, are out there range, the ones that interest me the most are Wyndham Clark. But I've already got a big bet. Well, I'd say a big bet. I've got a big priced bet on him on the exchange. Um, I mean, Oberg just plays well everywhere. I've got no interest in JT. I've got no interest in Hovland. I think Neiman's worth a very close look. I think Matsuama's worth a very, very close look. And I'm undecided on Cam Smith and Will Zalatoris. And you can't back them all. <laughs> no. Can't back them all. What about a deeper price? You know, this, this 40s and above that we were going through historically that have generated some juicy winners. Mm. So Matsuama 45s, Garcia 45s, Reed 55s, Watson 55s, Willett 66s. Is there anyone in that kind of range that's piqued your interest? What? Probably, yeah, de- definitely one. Go on, Bo. Give us the I, I back. I, I will. I, who's the I've already backed him on the exchange because it's up near 70 wow. and I will back I, yeah it's lovely and I will back him each way because there's just there's a lot of good golf coming out of him <laughs> needs to get that win um, the big win like since since his major like he won the BMW PGA but what wants that one over in the States it's Shane Lowry Something's something's got to give. He either goes completely off the boil or he wins. It's mm. it's just it, it feels like the the pressure is there, you know, and it's going to snap in one way or another. So yeah, he'll have um, he'll have a just find that kind of mix of price and places next week for the each way bet on him. I don't think I don't think Shane's a difficult puzzle to actually get right, and I I hear so many people saying they can't read Shane Larry right. I don't really understand it. If he's playing in the States and he's playing at a typical PGA Tour, we've watered the greens beyond life tournament, he's got no chance. As soon mm-hmm. as you take him to a tough golf course, a PGA National at Bay Hill where the wind's blowing and the, where there was a bit mm-hmm. of release in greens and tough rough, guess what? Oh, Shane's near the top of the leaderboard. So if we're seeing a weather pattern that comes into Augusta next week that looks like it's going to cause problems, Shane becomes a real angle. Mm. That's bad. His, his last four results: fourth, third, nineteenth, twenty ninth. His last four Masters: twenty fifth, twenty first, third, sixteenth. Absolutely. The ingredients. The ingredients are there. Absolutely. Can I back you up statistically, Barry? Um, Please do. One of the um, one of the other angles I just started to work through is going back to Steve's um, trends piece. Trends article. Three key statistics he picks out on that are height to apex, strokes gain approach, and par four birdie or better. Now, if you rank all the field, and notwithstanding what we've talked about, the live players don't appear in this. Um, if you rank all all of the field that do appear in those three stats for the season today and average the positions of all three of those stats, then the top five read Fifth, Shane Lowry. Fourth, Xander. Third, Cam Young. Second, Wyndham Clark, who Steve just mentioned. And first is Tony Finnell once again. Tony the Terminator Finnell. <laughs> Tony Finnell. The artist formerly known as T4. T, yeah, T10 at the Masters. Well, no, no, you've, you've mucked it up. The, the, he was Terminator. He, he was then Tony T2 now, and then previous to that, um, he was T4 now. Yeah. Mm. In fact, you could in probably archives. still call him T4 now when it comes to majors. Mm. But we've always said on this podcast, he's always got a very underrated major championship curriculum vitae. Mm. He doesn't mind mucking. He doesn't mind mixing it, does he? In majors, no, 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 no. So forty to one out there right now. I wonder if we'll get forty-five to one with some extended places next week because he seems to be drifting a little bit. Don't forget he was yeah, second. He's not, he's not being back right now. No, no, he's not. Don't forget he was second last time out, and he has got a fantastic, well, consistent record at the Masters. 
um, of finishing in those kind of top eight, top ten positions. Potent- Never missed the cut. Yeah, yeah. Potent- potentially the Masters. Who could, uh, who, who could find the each way places. From an each way perspective, if you get an extended places, Shane, fifth on that list I just read through, Finnell, mm. both of them got to be considerations, considerations I think. Hmm. Food for thought. Anybody in anybody in that region interests you, Steve? In what region? In that region of prices. 40-50 kind of bracket, I suppose. Well, definitely Shane. There's a lot of love. There's a lot of love going around for Sahith. I'm more tempted, you know, in that 80 to 1 area, and I can see Patty Reed. Just beaming at me. If he does anything of any any sort at Doral, which is a golf course he loves, he'll be fifties. He's he'll be fifties, really but annoying. he'll be. Oh, I don't know about fifties, but he'll he he certainly won't be getting eighties. But he's going to be tempting, isn't he? Mm. I mean, put it this way: if, Would you take Patrick Reed at eighty to one? Or little Diddy Brian Harmon at forty-five to one with Paddy Power. I mean, it's just ridiculous. I love Brian Harmon, but he ain't. He's not contending around Augusta. Mm. <laughs> not happening. Yep. No, I get that. With Reed, he's so damned hard-nosed. You might find he could get right into the heat of the battle and hang around as well. Yeah, particularly if it's a challenging renewal, which again we're a week mm. out, but suggest there's going to be some some challenge out there. Yeah, yeah Pat, you know, Patrick Reed at eighty to one, or Tyrrell Hatton at eighty to one. That every time he goes there, moans that he doesn't like Augusta and the setup isn't very good mm. at Augusta of all places. I mean, what the hell? It's not even a conversation, is it? Mm-hmm. So yeah. There's players there that I like. It's as ever. It's like being. It's like going to a, a into a nice sweet store, isn't it? And there's so much you like the look of, but you can't get to all of it. Mm. That's kind of where I'm at. Anything? Anyone at big, big, big prices? I I said to Andy on his podcast yesterday. You look statistically right now. There aren't many pl- players playing better tee to green golf than Siwoo Kim. Yeah. And I'm seeing triple digit hundred to ones out there, although he's been back today. Yeah, there's a bit of a mix of prices there, which is never a bad thing from a punting perspective. Shows some uh, disparity between the bookmakers' thoughts on him. But yeah, Siwoo potentially the kind of players who could go well. Uh, I don't know. We've talked about Jake Knapp and how he might perform on his uh, his Masters debut, but he was pretty poor last time out, wasn't he? When he carrying our money, Barry. Yes, he forgot to hit the button on the kettle to boil it. Mm. <laughs> Just, um, yeah, I mean, he could, he could, he might not, but might might be a fun bet if you can get him at one hundred and fifty or one hundred seventy five to one with extended places, stack of places, but, yeah. Probably get my interest for a couple of euro each way. Mm. Lucas Glover three hundred to one. When after he wins this week, Steve, then he's not going to be that wise. <laughs> I just knew you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've been. I've. I've kept hearing over the last six weeks that Keith Mitchell's probably the best golfer on earth, and if he doesn't win the Valero this week, he's not even going to be playing at the Masters. So, no. you know, people have opinions on golfers, don't they? Mm-hmm. You, oh, you, there's going to be you, an asterisk. Lucas Glover there's doesn't owe an... us anything after last summer. No, we love him. No. Yeah, good luck, Lucas. Have you heard anything before we close this down on Tiger Woods? Any likelihood of Tiger playing next week? Just the usual Nota Begay stuff. Those little, you know, compensating it. But he just said it's. It's whether he can string the four rounds of walking together. He said he can play the game. Ankle is kind of left ankle's frozen, lower back's kind of very tight and not very movable. But it's all about the four rounds of walking and recovering between rounds, mm. yeah. which which is hardly anything 
shocking or astonishing or revelatory to to us. We've all we can all see. Anytime Tiger's been out there, that's per, you know, visually the case. So this this is the first time it's felt going into a big tournament that he's not he like my uh, when he was going into Riviera, there was a huge like, oh, Tiger's going to play Riviera. Going into the Masters, maybe it just hasn't built up to the hype yet, be, or the hype hasn't built up yet because it's the Thursday before. But it feels there's so many other storylines that are, we don't need the Tiger storyline to make mm. it a big thing. It just yeah. it is. No, I get that. And if he doesn't play, I, it, I don't feel like anything's going to be overly lost from the tournament. Is that no. bad to say? No, I think it's fair. Yeah. Just be- no, there are so many different subplots. Yeah, I, I hope I hope he does. I hope he can play four rounds and is you yeah. know reasonably comfortable and not struggling and grimacing and mm. be cool to watch him you know paint his way around there. Yep. Mm. Agreed. Anything else to add, or should we close it down? No, all good. I think. A few more days of analysis and then uh, see where it takes us for next week. Absolutely. Thank you for your time, gentlemen. And yourself. You too, guys. Back to our Valero Texas Open uh, leaderboard watching. <laughs> I hope. Uh, I hope. You, well, I'm not even going to say that. I'm not going to. I'm not going to close off with that because it's. Got, you know, we, we haven't got to that stage yet. Um, I will point you in the direction of the description where I will put a link through to my research piece. There's a lot more information in there. Golf betting system linked to the homepage as well. The strokes gained rankings piece of work that Paul done is absolutely fantastic. It has to be said. I was playing with it earlier. Um, Columns there of different skill sets are all rankable. It's just really, really good, really worth looking at. So that's something I would point in your direction. Uh, yeah, so come and use Golf Betting System completely free of charge. We will be back with our tips pod next Tuesday. The date is the 9th of April. Until then, we'll see you soon. If you like betting on golf. But everyone that you back misses the cut Get some experts involved With all the stats and the tips and so much more Cause it's the golf betting system The golf betting system is the golf